speaker tonight really needs no introduction, but that won't stop me from trying to provide introductions. So, two things. Um, so, Susan Hockfield became president of MIT in 2004, and that clearly gave her an amazing opportunity to have a perspective of everything that goes on at MIT, which um, obviously was a huge advantage in writing the book that she's just written. Before she came to MIT, she was at Yale, where she served as a professor of neurobiology, dean of the graduate school, provost, and many other roles. Um, she's currently a professor of neuroscience at MIT, also a faculty member of the Koch Institute for Innovative Cancer Research, and a lifetime member of the MIT Corporation. Um, she's also one of a very small number of people that have ever been selected to be an honorary alumna of MIT. Um, as you may know, yes. Um, as you may know, MIT does not give honorary degrees. Um, you get a degree from MIT, you have to earn it the hard way, as many of us did. Um, so making someone an honorary alum is really the greatest honor that MIT can bestow upon people and President Hockfield was made an honorary member of the Alumni Association. I could probably spend the entire evening singing accolades of all of her accomplishments, but if I did that, then she wouldn't have time to tell you about the great book that she's written. So if you want to know more about President Hockfield's background, you can Google her. But um, <laughs> now, um, I am pleased to introduce our speaker tonight to talk about the age of living machines, President Emerita Susan Hockfield. Thank you for the introduction. I was just uh, really delighted to be invited to give uh, uh, my talk to the um, to an MIT audience, the MIT alumni audience. It is indeed, I feel quite honored by the Alumni Association to have been an honorary alum, and I do know how hard it is to get an MIT degree. And um, I don't really feel like I, I, I kind of squeak into the Alumni Association <laughs> for my efforts, but um, I feel the honor really quite profoundly. So um, tonight I'm going to share with you the story of my new book. It came out just in May. And uh, it's a very optimistic view of the future. For those of you who know me, you'll know I tend to be optimistic. But I think there's really good reason to be optimistic about the future if we think about the technology opportunities ahead of us. Um, I'm going to say I hope plenty of time for questions. Sometimes they get carried away, so I'll try and restrain myself. Um, but um, as Bonnie alluded to, it was an amazing privilege to meet MIT. Uh, from you know the perspective of the president's office, you gaze across this incredible uh, array of discovery and innovation. And I have to say, I believe there are very few people in the world who have the privilege of seeing this array of the components of the future emerging. You know, really as we um, as we watch them. So it gave me a breathtaking perspective of the ideas, discoveries, and applications. So while I have an optimistic story to tell, as we think about our future, it is, um, let's just say, um, challenging, right? We anticipate, we can debate this, uh, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 billion people on the planet by 2050, we're uh, just shy of uh, 8 billion today. and. Um, we're not really dealing with some of the issues that we have ahead of us. Now, I have to say that um, this question of whether we have the technology, I'm just going to get out from behind the uh, podium and talk to you. Uh, the question of whether we have technologies or will have technologies to deal with impending disaster is not new. So in 1798, Reverend Robert Malthus wrote a piece of the uh, principles of population. And in it, he made a very um, cogent and important observation, which is that the rate of agricultural productivity increase was slower than the rate of increase in population. He found this quite alarming. Who wouldn't? And when he went back and did a very interesting demographic analysis of Britain and uh, Western Europe using whatever uh, uh, data he could collect, he realized that this happens again and again. He says, every time this happens, it ends badly. So population gets readjusted back to a size that can be supported by agricultural productivity, by wars, famine, 
pestilence. And he wrote this treatise in 1798, basically proclaiming the end is near. And you know, many, in many epochs in the history of civilization, he would have been right, but he ended up being wrong. And he was wrong because there were technologies emerging that would actually change this odd dynamic between population and agricultural productivity. The two technologies, and there were probably others, first was four field crop rotation, which allowed farmers in, the, in Britain to grow more produce you know, over their crop over a number of years. That was a big um, innovation. But probably more important was um, a discovery. And it was a discovery of chemistry. So those seafaring explorers that I read about when I was in fourth grade, they were going around the world and bringing back, what did we read about? Gold, tea, spices. Another thing they encountered on their voyages were islands that were, of course, uninhabited by people, but inhabited by birds. Lots of birds. And these islands were actually a little bit of land, but above the land were piles and piles of guano, bird poop. And guano is very high in nitrogen, so a fantastic fertilizer. So these seafaring um, uh, pioneers were bringing back bird guano. There's a very, very uh, robust trade in guano. I gave this talk down uh, in Woods Hole uh, a few weeks ago, and someone pointed out that there had been a guano factory in Falmouth that actually was furnishing fertilizer for uh, the new, for uh, the, the burgeoning uh, agricultural uh, activities of America. Anyway, these two technological innovations really accelerated uh, food productivity in uh, Britain. Uh, the result of that, of course, was an increase in population, and one could consider that that increase in population occurred just in time to provide the workers that were needed for the Industrial Revolution. So Malthus was wrong that time, but one of the things we have to consider is would Malthus be right today? And um, just to kind of, you know, not to uh, draw on every possible awful thing that could happen, I just want to call out a few things that are real problems for us in terms of healthcare access, accuracy, and cost. Right now, healthcare consumes about 18% of our GDP and is uh, destined to, uh, to use more of it. In terms of energy, uh, we are already not using energy and producing energy in a way that's sustainable. You know, feel what you may about uh, the perils of climate change. It's very clear that if, as predicted, those almost 10 million people on the planet are going to have twice the energy demand that we have today, this is not uh, an equation that we're solving well today. And of course, war, water and food sufficiency and security. I was talking to someone who works in the future of agriculture, and he pointed out that if this 10 million people on the planet by 2050 is accurate, and by the way, we can only hope that it will be 10 million wealthier people who want a better lifestyle. He said that feeding those people with our current technologies would require land mass, agricultural land mass, equal to the land mass of both South America and Africa together. That's not happening. So we've got to get our technology aligned to do all these things. So for me, as we think about historically what has happened that has prevented a Malthusian dilemma, it is always innovation. It's always technology that has saved the day. And I'm going to make an argument for you that there are technologies coming along that do promise uh, to get us out of the Malthusian dilemma that we're facing. So uh, my responsibility as MIT's president, of course, was to look out into the future and be sure the Institute was going to be positioned to be a leader in the future. And I don't know about all of you, but my crystal ball gets pretty fuzzy after about five years. And so really looking at that distant future was, you know, uh, let's just say uh, I would have done that with very little accuracy. So, and instead of kind of just randomly going out thinking about the future, I thought, well, why don't we look at the future we're living in today and how we came to this future, which is really quite amazing in many ways. And then maybe from there I can figure out what the recipe is going to be for the future we'll be living in tomorrow. So, um, you know, this often happens to me. I came up here without my cell phone. Does anyone have a cell phone? <laughs> I suspect it much a technologically savvy audience. Actually, every audience. <laughs> no, no, it's okay, uh, it's just, it was just a, a test case. Because um, if we think about the technologies that transformed our lives most profoundly in the 20th century, I don't think anyone would do 
yesterday that it was not the digital revolution. So the digital revolution that provides our cell phones, the computers, this marvelous way of projecting slides, really changed our lives in uh, ways that are, would have been almost inconceivable, uh, say, at the beginning of the 19th century. Where did this come from? Where did these technologies come from? So as I thought about where they came from, they came from a convergence of physics with engineering that I'll describe to you uh, just very briefly. Uh, and that convergence produced the electronics industry, the computer industry, the information industries, and really equipped us with these the technologies, as I say, would have been inconceivable at the beginning of the 19th century and 1900. Um, and my uh, thesis for today's talk is that there are, is a new convergence that is gaining traction, gaining, gaining um, velocity today that I think is going to give us new technologies for the 21st century. So let me start with a little bit of history that, from MIT, you all likely know this. So where did this digital technology uh, revolution come from? If we think about what was going on in the 19th century, Physicists were exploring the physical world. One of my heroes over here, uh, Michael Faraday, famous for extraordinary experiments that examined, described the behavior of electromagnetism. The behavior. He had no idea what the forces were, but he was a brilliant observer and he described electromagnetism. It wasn't until much later in the 19th century when people like J.J. Thompson and others of his colleagues began describing the particles, the forces, the parts list of the physical world. So J.J. Thompson discovered the electron, described the electron in 1897, and there was a host of other discoveries around the same time that did, gave us a parts list for the physical world. And that parts list was picked up by engineers and turned into electronics, radios, televisions, various things like that. that that, of course, led to the computer information industries. Now, again, I love talking to an MIT audience because I believe you all get this. I'm happy to answer questions at, at, at the end, but um, if you think about what Faraday and Thompson were doing, they weren't inventing a TV. They were simply curious about the way the world worked and were just uh, totally abandoned in pursuing how the world worked, the physical world worked worked until um, they could understand it better. Now, we understand the importance of fundamental research, of discovery research in building technologies in the future, but it is always challenged. So here's an example. This may be apocryphal. This is an exchange that is reported to have occurred by the Secretary of the Treasury, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who asked Faraday, why would you be doing this? And Faraday is reported to have said quite candidly, no. I really don't know. I'm curious about this, but you know, someday you'll be able to tax it. <laughs> and indeed, I did pay tax when I bought my last iPhone, and you did too. So basic research is very inefficient because you never know where you're going, but it is the only route, the only route to discovery and the development of new technologies. So um, for you, uh, the MIT audience, I love to call out Carl Taylor Compton one of MIT's just most astonishing presidents, 1930 to 1949. And in 1937, he decided that we should be celebrating the anniversary of the discovery of the electron. Now, you all know, in 1937, he had not yet turned all of his attention to the prosecution of technologies for World War II. So if you read what he wrote in 1937 and earlier, it doesn't sound like the Carl Taylor Compton we know, but he wrote this marvelous, marvelous kind of hand to the electron, which I just love. And um, it, it's fun for me. I was president of AAAS a couple of years ago. And uh, this was part of his AAAS president's address. My AAAS president's address was, is the talk I'm giving you today. So <laughs> a little bit of parallelism. Not that I would ever put myself on the same uh, plateau as Carl Taylor Compton. In any case, so in this uh, description of the power of the electron, he points out uh, there is no instance that has been so dramatic as the discovery of the electron. He goes on to talk about how it transformed physics and chemistry and astronomy into real sciences. And then he says that they're fraught with, fraught with intellectual adventure and interpretations and practical values. 
because by 1937, there were products of the electronics industry that clearly came from these early discoveries. Really, really brilliant. So my point is simply, physicists came up with a parts list, engineers, bless them, turned those parts into objects of commerce, not just, you know, great uh, marketplace uh, products, but also entirely new industries. Now, um, even in 1937, this convergence of physics with engineering, convergence 1.0, if you'll allow me to call it that, was coming along. But actually, the real acceleration happened in World War II. And as you all know, Vannevar Bush was the architect of the US's contributions to the technology development that ended up leading World War II. At the beginning of the war, we didn't have any of the technologies that were going to be needed to win the war. Um, but he and a bunch of uh, re remarkable people, including Carl Taylor Compton, uh, orchestrated a technology burst that uh, I believe is you know, just unprecedented. As the war was winding down, uh, FDR asked uh, Bush whether there were things that we could learn from the use of technologies for the war. And his response is one of the most important treatises about science, I believe, that has, frankly, ever been written. The treatise, the essay is called Science, the Endless Frontier, and he delivered it to FDR with the following statement, that we can use the lessons that we learned in the wartime application of science to be applied profitably in times of peace. And what he suggested was that rather than having the nation go into the usual post-war depression, after a nation has expended more than the resources it could ever have imagined to have or ever will have, prosecute the war, you return from the war, you stop spending money, you have people coming back from the war, they don't have jobs. It was almost always a situation of economic depression. And Bush said, no, no, we shouldn't stop spending money, we should spend more money. We should be spending money at the rate we spent during the war, because that will build the future of our country. And he wrote the prescription, the blueprint for this down in terms that are just astonishing. Any of you who has read this, uh, you will know what I'm talking about. It. He talked about the GI Bill. He talked about community colleges. He talked about mortgages for GIs. All about fueling the economy. But most importantly, he talked about expending vast sums of money for fundamental research to develop the industries and the economic growth that would fuel America's future. A great idea. A great idea. FDR got it. And his successors, let's just say, were not as enthusiastic. So it got started a little sleepily. And you know, some money was put to fundamental research. And then, <laughs> Sputnik. You know, take something off and to wake a nation up. And so with the uh, Russian challenge for the domination of space, President Kennedy set forth a national ambition and we've celebrated the 50th anniversary of the moon landing this year with um, you know, great celebration and great excitement, great detail about the thousands of men and women who made that adventure possible. So he, Kennedy gave a number of different speeches about it. I really love this particular quotation from a speech he gave at Rice University. And he says, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. And because they're hard, they're going to serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. And this just still takes my breath away as a call to action. And it was a call to action not just to the scientists and engineers. It was a call to action for the nation. And you'll, of course, remember that the time of the nation was not a smooth time. There was a lot of messy stuff going on. But um, this really did as I say, drive the national ambition that served us very well. When he announced that, the, the, uh, that we go to the moon, we didn't have any of the technologies in hand, a little bit like the beginning of World War II. We didn't have any of the technologies in hand to win the war, but we put them together to do so. So um, now, uh, you know, to talk about national ambitions, what is it good for? It's good for building technology, but it's also good for building human resources. People often ask me where I came from. I grew up under the shadow of Sputnik. This is a picture of me with my three sisters. Um, there I am, the second. Uh, and um, I was 
under this shadow of spotlight, but it wasn't a dark, scary shadow. It was a bright beacon of opportunity and potential. And my mother found this fabulous essay, or uh, let's just say uh, second grade essay, <laughs> that I wrote. And I'm hoping none of you can actually read the way I wrote or see the handwriting. I have edited a little bit to, to give you a sense of what I was thinking about when I was in second grade, how I was riding on this national ambition uh, mission as many people in you know our at our age was, was doing were we doing so um if those of you who can't see this will see why i got c's in here um, and let's just say that yeah the the spelling isn't so good uh, the drawing is like even worse than that one of my sisters is a great artist that was not me um, but here I clearly articulate this thing about someone else someone else could be a scientist i did not know at the time that i was writing my autobiography <laughs> Uh, but indeed, that became my passion. And the important thing, uh, you know, for me in going back to this and thinking about the power of a national ambition, is that um, somehow I understood, even as a second grader, how important it was to prosecute these very, very difficult goals. <coughs> but even while prosecuting it, it was fun. And this is the marvelous paradox about doing the kind of work we do at MIT and other universities is that while pursuing something that you deeply love, then it's fun for you, you're also doing good for others. Anyway, enough about me. So the products of the convergence at 1.0, the convergence of physics with engineering are enormous. As I say, they permeate every nook and cranny of our lives. We can hardly imagine life without them. So uh, not just you know new ideas, new discoveries, but new industries and economic growth. So the second half of the 20th century in the United States is absolutely astonishing in terms of what we were able to produce and the growth in economic well-being. So, but where was biology at the time? Uh, not, uh, almost nowhere. So, in 1950, biology was pretty much still a descriptive science. It would take three revolutions in how biology was thought about in order to generate for biology the same kind of parts list that made these innovations out of engineering and physics happen. So the first revolution in molecular in modern biology was molecular biology. And this was done by an astonishing group of investigators. I'm just showing some of them here. Jim Watson, Francis Crick, Rosalind Franklin, Maurice Wilkins. Um, they, and actually it was a small army of former physicists who discovered the structure of DNA and the power of DNA to self-replicate and therefore why cells, individual cells, give rise to lots of cells that are just like them gave us hints about actually very important insights into the hereditary of, uh, uh, nature of genetic information. It's given us insight into diseases, how diseases happen and their cause. Not all of them, but we've gotten started. So molecular biology, most importantly in my mind, gave us a unifying concept for all of these things. So I went to college, you know, and most of you went to college, and you know, at the time there was botany, which was separate from animal behavior, which was separate from microbiology, there wasn't any sense that there was something common among them. Molecular biology gives us general principles for all of biology, very powerful. Molecular biology was a gene-by-gene -gene approach. One of the, uh, you know, for me, you know, really great um, outcomes of this was, for some diseases, getting single genes. So sickle cells were a really good example. Or another great example from, you know, right here is Bob Weinberg's discover of, discovery of the HER2 oncogene, a gene that can turn a cell into a cancer gene. He called it HER2. And just to tell you how hard it is to turn these discoveries into something that's useful, between his discovery of the HER2 gene, oncogene, and the development of Herceptin, a very effective drug for a particular kind of breast cancer that previous to this drug was a death sentence, was 20 years and a lot of money. It's hard work, but there are people who are devoted to making these, turning these discoveries into real applications. So molecular biology was a gene-by-gene -gene approach. The second revolution was um, genomics. Genomics allows us to take um, many, many, many different genomes and, and, and understand them uh, together. It's a many-by-many -many approach. And genomics allowed us to study all kinds of things, like the microorganisms in the ocean, like the 
uh, properties of contagious diseases, who resists them, who succumbs to them. Various things like that that require almost a population level analysis. Now, the success of genomics I have charted here, and just kind of for fun, I competed against Moore's Law. Moore's Law doesn't have a y-axis, but you know, in 2002, you could put 40 million uh, uh, transistors on a chip. In 2016, it's about 18 billion. So that's pretty rapid progress. If we think about the cost of sequencing a human genome and the technology that's developed that's gone behind it, when the first genome cost $100 million to sequence, it took about 10 years. Now it costs, I mean, I yeah, can never keep up with it, but less than $5,000 to sequence the genome if you get a certain level of resolution, and it can be done in less than half a day. This is an astonishing development of uh, yeah, technological development that has given us opportunities to study things in ways we could never have imagined. In this building, and the one next door, people are looking at genes for schizophrenia and autism, complex diseases like diabetes, in hopes that we will be able to decode what gives rise to these diseases and come up with solutions like Perceptin. The third um, revolution is what I'm really, you know, the purpose of this talk is, is a conversion between biology and engineering. So genomics, molecular biology provide a parts list for the biological world. And guess what? Engineers love parts lists and are picking up these parts and turning them into technologies. So uh, one of the uh, signal moments in my MIT presidency, when I arrived, of course, I had to meet a lot of people and learn about what a lot of, you know, many people's ambitions were, what they were working on. And of course, um, very high on my list of need to meet people was the Dean of Engineering. Because as you all know, MIT's largest school is the School of Engineering, and it's been ranked number one since U.S. News and World Report has done a ranking uh, of, of, of engineering. So Tom McNanty was very high on my list of people to meet. Um, and so when I met with him, he of course reminded me at the outset that the school was the largest school. The most important school, and it's important that I remember that. And I'll my mind. But then he told me something that really set me on the path that I'm talking about today. He told me that of the almost 400 faculty in the School of Engineering, one third of them, this is in 2004, one third of those faculty were using biological parts in their work. And I said, oh yeah, yeah, you know, biomedicine. And he said, cool, biomedicine isn't half of it. They're using biological parts to solve all kinds of technological challenges. And that really got my attention. And that's really what I'm talking about today. So um, this convergence of biology and engineering, I wrote the book because it's a general theme. There are so many examples of it that you would not recognize as examples of it unless you know someone says, hey, this is all the same thing. So, theme. so that's why I have written this book, to help people understand that there is a current to the 21st century technology story that is about using biological tools in technological, uh, to solve technological challenges. I'm going to give you only three examples tonight so you can understand the relationship. Um, I'm going to use one example from medicine, one from energy, and one from water, but they are, you, you probably all can think of another half dozen easily. So um, the first example is um, from Sankita Bacha's lab. Sankita Bacha works across the street, the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. Sankita is MD, PhD. She's a physician, she's a biomedical engineer. And um, she is very interested in early detection of disease. Now, the technology I'm going to describe could be applied for any disease, but I'm going to use as an example cancer. And so what Sangeeta uh, reasoned was that um, every tissue in the body expresses a particular set of genes and a particular set of proteins. And diseases also have signature gene expression and signature proteins. And she said, you know, there are ways of detecting cancer, um, you know, colonoscopy, mammography. She said, it's just not um, that accurate or that early. Maybe I could do better if I got down to the chemistry. And so thinking about cancer, cancer starts as a one cell, a small group of cells, the cells eventually will figure out how to escape from the organ in which they start. Now, your liver doesn't behave that way, and under normal conditions, your skin doesn't behave that way, your eye doesn't behave that way. Cells stay where they belong. And part of the reason they stay, stay where they belong is there are proteins in between cells that keep them in their places. Cancer evades that. 
cancer evades that because cancers make particular enzymes. The enzymes are proteins that are like molecular scissors that cut up the proteins that are inhibiting cells from moving you know, into other spaces. These cancer enzymes are known. They've been identified and cloned. And so saying, you know, if there were a way for me to detect those enzymes, that might be a way to find cancer early. <clears throat> and that's what she's done. So she um, starts with a uh, nanoparticle. It doesn't really make much difference what the composition of that nanoparticle is, except that you want it to not react with uh, the tissues that it's going to encounter. And then she attaches uh, a little small bit of protein, a small peptide, with this gold uh, uh, stalk. What she's engineered in that gold stalk is the enzymatic site for a cancer enzyme. So here's the deal. You get injected with this full nanoparticle that's decorated with these uh, stalks and peptides. If there isn't any cancer, nothing happens. The nanoparticle just goes away of all things that go out in the trash from your body. But if there is cancer, this gold part of this gold uh, little Pac-Man represents the cancer enzyme. Will cut these cancer uh, enzymatic sites and release these very small particles uh, from the nanoparticle. She's engineered these particles to be small enough that they filter easily back into the blood, and then. Most brilliantly, they're so small that when the blood gets to the kidney, the kidney just says, oh, that's trash, and it goes out in the urine. The urine, under normal conditions, has very, very little protein. There's little, very little in the urine. So that the signal from these little cutoff uh, peptides really shows up. And she has ways of amplifying the signal. So if you don't have cancer, nothing shows up in the urine. If you do have cancer, you pee on a stick. You can measure the uh, presence or absence of the peptide on that, on that, uh, that little bit of filter. So um, using, uh, she started a company called Most Bio, and used the animal models. This method detects cancers with their one-tenth the size of our current detection methods, and they're going to be in clinical trials uh, in 2020. Very, very powerful. And by the way, this idea of using urine to detect a signal rather than blood is very powerful. and. Um, I don't know, looking around the room, some of you may have heard of uh, over-the-counter, cheap, very accurate urine test. <laughs> right, anybody? <laughs> so many of the technologies are already in place, really accepted. So this is a very powerful way to make detection of cancer a lot earlier than it is today. The best approach to dealing with cancer, A, don't get it. Second, uh, detect it early. The second example I'm going to give is um, uh, also from the Koch Institute, Angela Belcher, who is the incoming uh, department head in biological engineering, is a materials uh, scientist. And in this picture over here, Angie is holding um, an abalone shell. And the abalone shell is filled with coin cell batteries. So Angie went to uh, school at UC Santa Barbara, and she loved walking the beach. And, you know, I love walking the beach, but I just like walking the beach. She actually loved walking the beach because she was fascinated by abalone and other sea creatures. And she thought, this abalone shell is really something. It's lightweight, it's really strong, it's beautifully architected. And abalone make it simply with the components of the sea they're living in. They build it without making any toxic byproducts. And when the abalone dies, the shell disintegrates into component parts for the next abalone of the next sea creature to build its shell. And she said, wow, you know, Abalone can do this amazing feat of engineering without contaminating its environment. Why can't we? Good idea. And so Angie has turned her laboratory into basically a bio factory to build things that we want. She started out with nanowires, figured out how to make viruses build nanowires. And she now uses viruses to build batteries. She uses uh, what's illustrated here. This is uh, a standard lab form of virus called M13. Any lab that works with viruses works with M13. We know a lot about its structure. We know how to modify it. Uh, we know how to make it do things that we want it to do. And what Angie challenged her viruses to do was can viruses, which normally organize biological materials, organize inorganic materials. And indeed, her viruses do. 
So she has her viruses building cathodes and anodes uh, that then get packaged into the standard coin cell packages that you would buy if you were going to replace your battery in your whatever electrical device that you're replacing your batteries yourself. And that's why these batteries here look just like batteries you buy at CVS. Now, Angie's virus made batteries have the same charge density as state of the art lithium ion batteries. And they, have, they go through as many charge and discharge uh, cycles as state of the art batteries. These are critical elements for batteries. Now, um, uh, this is a, an incredible example of the convergence of biology with engineering. I came back from one of these talks and saw Angie in the corridor. I asked her a question that I had gotten in the audience um, about the batteries. And she said, oh, but we're not using lithium anymore. We're now using these viruses to build highly effective batteries that are lithium-free and cobalt-free. This is a very important innovation. Our current manufacturing technologies for lithium ion, which is state-of-the-art for uh, most of our uses, uses a lot of energy. Battery manufacturing is a heat-intensive process, and there are a lot of toxic byproducts. Angie's viruses build these batteries at room temperature, so right on the lab bench without any toxic byproducts. And so simply, even our lithium ion batteries would be an enormous um, advance over our current state-of-the-art um, batteries. Now, when we think about energy, you know, we're all excited about alternative energies. You know, you know how a day goes by, you don't need to read, need to read an article or find about solar or wind and how great this is going to be. You know, solar and wind would be great if the sun always shone or the wind always blew, but that doesn't happen. And so intermittency is a real problem for most alternative energy technologies. Now, uh, intermittency is solved by that energy storage. So right now, batteries, energy storage, is the rate limiting technology for the most uh, often used alternative energy strategy. So getting a better energy a storage method, getting better, better batteries that are more sustainable is absolutely critical. So I think Angie and others who are working this frontier are really onto a different way of thinking about an energy future that is more sustainable and um, will support 10 billion people without going to plan. The last example I'm going to give is uh, not from MIT. This is a story about water. And it starts in the lab of Peter Ockray, who's a hematologist at Johns Hopkins University. So water purification has been a problem since the beginning of civilization. There are drawings in, from Egyptian tombs from 1500 BC that show people using uh, water filtration um, and descriptions of water purification by distillation. We've been using the same technologies, and frankly, they're expensive, they're inefficient, they're just not good enough. So this is a story that starts again with fundamental science that was kind of an accident that ends up opening a new opportunity for purifying water. We already, if you it seems like every few months you hear a story about some part of the world. Of course, we know about various parts of the world that don't have clean water, sufficient clean water to meet their needs. So Peter Andre <clears throat> is a hematologist, and he decided for his research activity, he would study the RH protein. Uh, many of you know that the RH protein is the cause of RH disease. So when a uh, RH protein is a protein of red blood cells, and when a mother's RH protein is a different variant from her fetuses, the mother's immune system will mount a reaction against the fetus's RH protein and damage or kill the fetus. We have known now for many years how to mitigate that response, even without knowing what the RH protein is. And so Peter said, I'm going to find this RH protein. And he went through an incredible purification strategy, got lots of red blood cells, figured them out, you know, it purified the protein. Uh, looked to see what he had purified, and it wasn't the RH protein, it was something else. And he couldn't figure out what that protein was. Any reasonable person would have just gone back and done it again until he got the RH protein or went to a different project. But Peter couldn't get his head off this RH protein. Water is part of, the water commerce is part of what keeps us alive. All of our cells allow water to go in and water to go out. And people thought for many years there had to be a water channel, but no one could find it. So at the time that Peter was doing the study on the RH protein, the assumption was there wasn't any water channel. This was not something that was there. Water passed over through the cell membrane simply by diffusion. Well, P 
Peter had to decide what to do, and he couldn't let go of this protein. It ended up that he had inadvertently purified the water channel. The water channel is a feat of engineering. So this is showing you um, a cell cut in cross section. So this is the cell membrane on either side. And this is a cross section of the water channel. The water channel is like a barrel without a top or a bottom. And this shows the structure of the sides of the barrel <coughs> that have a composition. The amino acids in this protein uh, are arranged so that there are alternating positive and negative charges that shepherd water molecules through. Water molecules and only water molecules. Excuse me, speaking of water, I'm going to have a sip. <laughs> So um, he did an enormous number of studies. He won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for a, a brilliant, brilliant piece of work. So a biophysicist entrepreneur named um, Peter Holm Jensen was reading the operating papers, and he had an amazing idea. He said, huh, if the water channel purifies water for us, maybe we could use it to purify water larger scale. <clears throat> and he started a company called Aquaporin AS that is building water filters using the aquaporin protein. The, this is an example of a little sphere that has aquaporin uh, channels here. Contaminated water on this side, water flows through, only the pure water flows through. It's a fantastic water purification strategy. They are now selling um, uh, kitchen sink water filters in Asia, and their ambition is to scale this up to water purification commercially. It's much more efficient uh, than our current water purification strategies. Another example, the convergence of bio biology with engineering. I went to visit him at his company, and he said something that has just really stayed with me. He said, you know, if I had to design a water channel, it would bust my brain. Why don't we just use nature's genius? And that is exactly the story of all of these technologies. Just use nature's genius to solve the problems that we have, the technological problems we have. So um, this convergence of biology with engineering is enormously powerful. How do we implement this? We have a lot of challenges like, of getting people to talk across disciplinary boundaries. There's the innovator's dilemma. You know, having our departments organized, we've got just over toward MIT. You know, we've got a biology department. We've got a mechanical engineering department. They work very well. Why would we want to mess them up? So um, that's a, a, a problem. And we, you know, our technologies are pretty good. There are different languages. Um, one of the things that surprised me is biologists and engineers actually <coughs> learn different things. They have different languages, they have different approaches. They have different ways of defining a problem. There are enormous institutional impediments. If you try and get a grant from two people that are in different departments, or in different schools, or in different institutions, it is so hard to get that task. And our funding agencies, um, as you know, are organized by discipline. The NIH supports biology and biomedicine. The NSF does uh, you know, engineering and computation. The Department of Energy does physics. Uh, where are you going to get a grant funded that crosses these disciplines? Now, sometimes we've gotten together to build these cross <coughs> initiatives. Uh, the National Nanotechnology Initiative is one of the Human Genome Project, a collaboration between the Department of Energy and the NIH. We just don't do it routinely. We should be able to do the cross-institutional activities more routinely. So one example of something that's worked is the building across the street, the Koch Institute for Integrated <coughs> Cancer Research. Uh, we put together while I was president and a uh, further elaboration of the Center for Cancer Research that was started in 1974, with Salvador Luria as its lead. And we have architected uh, this cross-disciplinary work into the building, different layers of uh, collaboration. The first is that the floors are integrated, so no floors, only biologists or only engineers, and importantly, that there is one set of elevators, one stairway, one set of restrooms, one cafe, you got to talk to people from a different discipline. We did a lot of social engineering, including opportunities for uh, biologists to and engineers to understand the clinical problems, the biologists and engineers to actually talk together uh, so that they can understand one another's language and uh, make progress. 
one of the things I love about the Koch Institute, which is where my office is now, is that you know the faculty who are my age, maybe a little younger, they're always uh, they're new, and so they speak the other language with a little bit of an accent. That's what happens when you learn a new language when you're old. But the graduate students and the postdocs and the undergraduates, they are fully bilingual. They don't know whether they're biologists or engineers. They're just working at this intersection. It's been very productive. Um, the Koch activity is not just at the Koch Institute, but um, it draws on people you know, from many, many, many different uh, disciplines and schools at MIT. And you know, um, MIT doesn't have a medical school or a hospital. So uh, to, if you're working on a disease, it's important to have collaborators who actually work on the disease real disease. And so we established the Bridge Project that collaborates uh, with collaboration with the Koch Institute and the Dana Farber Harvard Cancer Center uh, across MIT. And this has also been just enormously productive. How do you measure success? Oh, right. Another element that makes things good for us in the center of Kendall Square. Phil Sharp, who uh, is one of my office suite mates, uh, says the technology travels on two feet. And indeed, um, it is um, not as hard as other places to take your technology out of the cove or out of the road or out of any of these buildings and walk across the street into a world of startups. So this is also a great facilitator. How do we measure progress? When we started the Coke Institute for, for Integrated Cancer Research, we were determined to make a difference in cancer. Continue our fundamental discovery, but also to make a difference in cancer. And if you measure that by the number of companies that have come out of the Coke, uh, since we launched, we're now at over 80 companies and um, you know, probably close to two dozen that are now in clinical trials. So it's been an extremely productive way of organizing a different way of getting people together around an ambition. And the ambition is to accelerate progress against cancer. This has been incredibly um, and wonderfully successful. Um, so we've talked about some of the challenges of the 21st century and the needs that almost 10 billion people are going to present to us. I believe that innovation is the answer, and um, we've done it before, and I think we could do it again. But what does that take? Bob Solo, one of MIT's great economists, a Nobel winner in uh, uh, economics, described the growth in the economy since World War II, demonstrating that 50% of that growth came from technology, demonstrating that you've got to do innovation. Um, but people always doubt it. Ernest Rutherford, I gave the example of, uh, of Maxwell and, um, and, uh, and Faraday. This is another great example. Ernest Rutherford, the father of nuclear, nuclear physics, the person who should have been able to see the future, says, if you're thinking about getting power out of these nuclear reactions, you're drinking moonshine. <laughs> but in less than 20 years, the first nuclear uh, power reactor was started up. So, Again, basic research is inefficient, but um, it's the only way we can get to new technologies. Um, unfortunately, our R&D trends are not pointing in the right direction. The red line here shows you uh, the percent of GDP, federal R&D investments over the years. We had a big peak in the uh, middle 60s. You'll understand the ambient conditions that drove it. And we're now down at about 0.8, 0.7% of GDP. Um, there are, is a lot of research funding by business, but that's mostly development and not the research side of the R&D equation. And you could say we're spending a lot of money. That's probably okay. And sure, after World War II, the United States was in this game by ourselves. The nations that could have competed were building, rebuilding their countries after the war. We had the privilege of not having to do that. Now today, the story is very different. Again, the red line is the United States, and you'll see that various countries are exceeding their, uh, our expenditures in um, uh, money devoted to RDP. And the line that um, worries me is this bottom line that was bottom. This is China. And I don't know whether last month or next month or next year, China will surpass uh, US investments as in, in research as percent of GDP. But China is really very much devoted to building this kind of infrastructure from the bottom up. And um, I think, uh, you know, I would prefer that the batteries of the future are bought from the United States, but we can buy them from someone else. I think we've got an opportunity that we're going to miss. So what do we need to do this? We need sustained commitment to federal investments and in basic research. 
we need to change the game in terms of funding across uh, across uh, agencies. We have done it in the past. We need to be able to do that more routinely. We need policies that support the kind of innovation that builds new industries. One idea that was um, promoted by Larry Fink uh, of, of BlackRock is privileging long-term investments. Right now, investments in new companies are privileged for you know maybe 18 months. If we could privilege, give a tax incentive to people who are willing to type their money for five years, 10 years, 20 years, that might be a way of persuading investments in uh, companies and industries that just take a lot longer to grow. And of course, um, at MIT, we do a lot of collaboration with industry. We're figuring out how to do more. I think all of us need to figure out how to have a shorter uh, interval between discovery and turning those discoveries into marketplace uh, products. So um, as you can tell, I am an enthusiast about the technology frontier and what the technology frontier promises. I'm an enthusiast about what uh, US, the United States has produced and can produce. Um, and I think that there are answers to the dilemmas that face us as we anticipate 10 billion people on the planet uh, by 2050. However, none of that happens without some effort. None of that happens without wise policy. And I think that um, as a nation, we would do well to pick up our game quite a bit because the future is waiting and the future we could invent. So with that, I have my book, which uh, tells the story in, uh, in some detail. But um, I think one of the most important things to tell you tonight, that this is a story that emerged from me at MIT. MIT is one of the few universities in the world that includes a top-rate, exquisite uh, enterprise in the life sciences, cheap by jowl, with the best engineering school that the world knows. And increasingly, uh, MIT is architecting ways that engineers and scientists can work together and I personally think that cross-disciplinary work is the way that we're going to get to a brighter future. I described in my book, I'm an optimist, but you know, I'm a, um, shall we say, a little realistic optimist. Uh, we don't get there with some hard work and some important commitments. I'm delighted to share this story with you tonight, and now delighted to take your questions. Thanks so much. <laughs> I was pleased to see at your last slide that the last panel was food. Having been a student uh, in Department 20, Department of Nutrition and Food Science, which I see no longer exists, <laughs> is there any plan to revive that? Oh, wow, what a great question. Um, there aren't science plans to revive that uh, department, but um, there's a lot of work going on at MIT around the components of food. Uh, I, I, the, um, in the book, I talk about a visit I made to the Danforth Plant Science Center outside of St. Louis. And um, I have to say the opportunities and the innovations around food are astonishing and delightful. Um, and one of, the, um, one of the things I failed to mention that you all know quite clearly, is the role of advanced computation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence in developing all these technologies. None of the technologies I described would be possible without a, an incredible uh, computational infrastructure. At the Danforth Center, they're using um, um, all kinds of uh, advanced computational tools to develop new crops uh, more rapidly. You know, it ends up that you know, sometimes we know the gene you need to add or take away to make a plant survive better, but usually we don't because usually it's a combination of traits. And so the old-fashioned method of doing crosses and seeing what comes out is still the best way to evolve better, sweeter tomatoes, uh, you know, pest-resistant crops. But the problem with that is you've got to screen thousands and thousands of plants in order to, you know, find the ones that you, that you want. What the Danforth has done is figured out how to do that computationally, which is just extraordinary. Um, there are any number of new ag co companies out there, and every day I read about one of them, and it just is very exciting. So I don't think it's going to happen at MIT. Um, they're in, in this kind of macro level of plants themselves, but there's a lot of work going on at MIT in terms of um, 
using microorganisms in um, ways to uh, promote uh, food growth. Unreservedly enthusiastic about more co more cooperation between private companies and university research, but there are perils to that too. The company determines what research gets done, as opposed to a kind of abstract intellectual effort. And if something doesn't work out, the company decides not to publish it. Although some failures are interesting and ultimately informative. Uh, what about these complications? How do you maintain yeah. the separation between a between real research and commercially driven enterprise. Thank you. Did you all hear that question well enough? So it is about the tension between uh, corporate interests and uh, basic discovery. And it's an important uh, concern. And I have to say, um, if I hadn't been at MIT, I wouldn't have the confidence that you can actually navigate those dangerous waters. And they are dangerous <coughs> waters. And so I think the, the incredible importance of focusing on pure fundamental research and having that funded completely separately from industry is important. But as your ideas emerge, the problem is knowing what is um, industrially viable, what is possible, and what um, doesn't work. And we had, um, I think, the first, uh, my first insight into the MIT way was the DuPont-MIT alliance. Uh, and the way that works is that DuPont has someone on campus <clears throat> kind of canvassing to see what ideas are ready. I often uh, describe uh, a university like MIT as um, a basket of solutions. And industry is a basket of problems that they've very clearly defined. And they don't really want to share their problems because once you've identified what the problem is. So how you draw, how you do the match between the problems defined by industry and the solutions that are looking for problems is a very, very interesting problem. And so this DuPont-MIT alliance actually um, figured out how to make those matches. The MIT Energy Initiative is another example. So sitting on campus, you have an idea about what the energy challenges are. Sitting in an energy company, you have a very different idea of what the solutions you need. So I'm not saying that the uh, industry support should go all the way back to fundamental research. We still need that. But in terms of making our potential solutions available to industry, I think MIT has done a very good job of that through our technology licensing officer, uh, office and um, allowing industry to actually shop our solutions to figure out where the match is made. So I'm, what I'm suggesting is that that, uh, that matchmaking needs to happen with a lot more alacrity than it does now. It's just very hard for companies to see what we're doing or for uh, our, uh, our scholars to understand what the targets might be and whether they've actually come up with something that could be useful. So I think it's very important to keep the separation of fundamental research and industry uh, the way it is, but I also think that there are ways we can speed up the translation of our discoveries into action. Hi. Um, this is very loud. <laughs> so uh, you showed, you made one point about uh, if we want to feed, feed ten, about 10 billion people in, in uh, 2050, or uh, yeah, then we would need a land mass the size of South America and Africa. And it doesn't seem, well, I don't know that much about how food is used today, but it doesn't seem like we need 80% of that land mass today. So what's what gives with the, uh, the sudden excellent um, yeah. excellent Yeah, yeah, good question. So um, all of the estimates about uh, population growth and, um, and uh, the requirements of productivity come out of UN studies and uh, the uh, estimate of uh, feeding this larger population has two factors. One is numbers, but as importantly, and probably more importantly than numbers, is people coming out of poverty. So there are people who are impoverished today and um, will not be impoverished when we hope by 2050 or we're going to be in the not losing the level of uh, being at war and um, you know, suffering from other ills that lead to population. 
So the factors in both the increased number, but also an increased lifestyle. And it's part of the energy equation also. So how do you double our energy in by 2050 if the population goes by 2 billion? Well, we know that as people, um, uh, with, with the transport urbanization, energy demands get uh, higher. And frankly, just with growing affluence, energy demands go up. So it, it, there is an exponential increase in demand, even if population is growing, uh, let's just say, uh, linearly. Um, I hate to bring politics, politics into this, um, but I, it, I, it's, it's important. Um, the space program on the moon required tremendous federal resources over an extended period of time. And had there not been a commitment by our leaders and society, it could have stumbled many places along the way. Today, 30 to 40 percent of people don't believe in science and facts. The funding for by the federal government, as you pointed out, is dropping. And China's government, central government, has decided to fund and create the biotechnology of the future. Do you have any suggestions on how we take, we change this trajectory so that our government funds what really is important to our future? Yeah, I hate this question. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, we have gone off course and gone back on course. And uh, the one example I give is after World War II, where as a nation we were following the standard model of stopping spending and driving the country into economic recession. And then we um, were um, awakened by the Russian challenge. And so we, as a nation, had developed the national ambition to go to the moon and back. And I don't think there is any substitute for leadership. Um, and at this point, I kind of lose my optimism <laughs> about our country's ability to set a target and a national ambition. And I worry about that in terms of what we're doing today and tomorrow the next five or 10 years. But um, my greater worry actually is for second graders who are uh, growing up in a time where ambitions are not shared ambitions, but they're quite individual ambitions. Uh, one of the principles of the university is that people come together because the whole is greater than some of the parts. And the first university back in the 12th century, scholars came together because they found the encouraging uh, to work together against the unknown. And um, you know, it's that together part <laughs> that we uh, lack uh, leadership around. Uh, and so I, I'm, uh, I'm not optimistic right now. But as I said, if you look at history, there are times when the United States has gone off and then come back. So I do still have confidence that our nation's uh, fundamental um, uh, beliefs, if you will, Word that we're not allowed to really use that, but you know our our, our nation's foundational uh, purpose uh, can and can be recovered with with leadership. Do I see it? Mm, not so much, but um, often leaders emerge in surprising ways. So it does require national leadership, but frankly, what it also requires, and one of my reasons for writing the book, is that our leaders do respond to. Um, what the electorate wants. And the more we can uh, share with them the potential, the optimism of the future, uh, I'm hoping that uh, that message will be conveyed to uh, people in leadership. Sorry, I can't go there. That answered that. That, that. that is the reason for writing the book, because I think this is a message that needs to be picked up. Uh, the book is written for a general audience, not for scientists or engineers. Uh, with the um, really firm belief. There are a lot of people who want to understand a path to a better future uh, that they can get behind. And um, uh, I have to say, as scientists uh, and engineers, we often do a very bad job of helping people understand what the possibilities really are. 
Uh, yeah, I think we have time for one one more quick question. Uh, perhaps could you? <laughs> Thank you for an excellent uh, presentation. So, uh, I'm not sure if I can present this clearly, but I will give it a shot. You know, about 50 percent of the world's population is very poor. They really need very simple solutions to improve their lifestyle. The researchers working in the Western world with all the data knowledge, they are working also for, for a living, and they're working for high paying ideas and cutting edge technologies. Is there a room for solving some of these very simple problems that 50% of the world's population faces and can be solved very quickly? Is there a way to break that into mainstream as an well, one of the things that I found like, more inspiring than I hear the number of projects that are devoted exactly to this problem. So how do you raise the standard of living? How do you create agricultural conditions so that people can get the most out of their farmland rather than the least out of their farmlands? You know, how do you provide um, easy to deploy water purification strategies? And so um, I know there are you know uh, people at MIT and a lot of uh, the uh, centers at MIT are actually devoted to this particular issue. And um, I have to tell you that um, among, if you just take one example, uh, on the medicine challenge, I include access. So as long as medicine is astronomically expensive, it is the province of wealthy countries and wealthy individuals. And so I think part of the challenge is developing uh, medical interventions, medical diagnostics that are accessible to everyone. And, um, I think that that is a critical part of, uh, as you say, the critical piece of the innovation enterprise is being sure that the things we invent are not for only the wealthy. Um, but I would also you know, add to that that if we can't figure out in the energy space, energy storage, this is, it, this, the, the, these new technologies are going to be useless to everyone, including people uh, in poor and wealthy nations. So a lot of these problems are bigger than you know, uh, than countries that are wealthy or poor. And I, I do have confidence that even some of these, um, you know, most uh, most cutting edge technologies are technologies that will bring down the cost of providing these necessary resources for all. I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that's about all we have. Uh... Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.